Scotland is a country well known for its folklore, especially the legend of Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. The loch that Nessie is said to live in is only one of over 30,000 freshwater locks in the country, which sees tourists from all over the world come to visit and take in the natural beauty. This natural beauty though, the clear bodies of water that grace Scotland's countryside, harbour a secret that nobody would suspect. A mess of internalised hatred. This is the case of William Beggs. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Do you want more Joshua Miles content? Do you want to hang out with me live, play chill games and discuss true crime with me? Then guess what? You can. Just jump over to twitch.tv forward slash Josh Miles and hit that cheeky little follow button where I stream every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Sundays at 9pm UK time. We hang out on stream whenever a new true crime video goes live where we'll talk about the case that's in the new video and just kind of hang out. It's like Joshua Miles after hours. Why? Follow me on Twitch. You can join our little community for free. You can find a link at the top of the description and in the pinned comments. Now back to the case. William Frederick Ian Beggs was born on Friday the 4th of October 1963 in Moira, County Down in Northern Ireland. He was one of five children, two younger brothers and two younger sisters, born to his parents William, who worked as a lecturer at a local college, and Winifred, who was a headmistress. William Strake's Protestant upbringing had been one surrounded by right-wing ideologies due to his parents' beliefs ideologies that were homophobic through and through. And William, despite this mentality instilled in him since birth, very quickly realised that he had been attracted to men. His parents were devoted to their beliefs and it was something that William threw himself into as he grew into a young adult. William attended the Society of Friends School in Lisbon and it was there that his teachers tried to give him gentle Quaker values. But William's interest in the same sex only developed further during his time there. According to one source, while classmates played football, William locked himself in his bedroom for hours on end, screaming out the violent lyrics of heavy metal music that blared from his stereo speaker. A former pupil of this school would later describe William as being, quote, a real loner and quite creepy. And I don't remember him ever having a girlfriend. Everybody thought there was something odd about him. He was quite clever at school, but more interested in his music. Another classmate of Williams would later describe him as, quote, being treated with almost blanket hostility, ostracised by almost everyone in the form. Nobody would sit near him, particularly women, because he made people feel very uneasy. He really was a creep. On a Duke of Edinburgh trip, which is a programme aimed at teenagers to get them out in nature and volunteering in their local community, William shared his tent with a young man, and this young man woke up during the night to find razor blades in his sleeping bag. As a result, William was left to sleep in the tent alone. It's interesting to note that when William had been a teenager, he had actually joined an anti-gay campaign, though the leader of this campaign actually removed him from it as the leader suspected that William was in denial himself. He suspected that William was gay. After finishing his education, graduating with nine O-levels and two A-levels, William applies to university. Though William's future plans for his educational career were destroyed after members of the Ulster Volunteer Force learnt of his sexual desire for men. And the Ulster Volunteer Force, or UHF, were the kind of people who carried out their own justice to people they deemed to be paedophiles, which included homosexuals within their definition, through the use of violent beatings and even fatal shootings. 
According to one source, the UHF gave William Beggs a choice. Either he leave Northern Ireland quietly, or he stay and suffer the consequences. Faced with this decision, William decided that he would leave. And so in 1982, William was more or less forced to leave his home due to his sexual orientation and moved to England, where he enrolled and started a course in public administration at Teesside Polytechnic in Middlesbrough. He rented a flat in Middlesbrough on Prince's Road. And during this course, William became the regional chairman for the Federation of Conservative Students, which is an ultra right-wing group. It was in this position that William actually ended up being invited to Downing Street by Margaret Thatcher. And that says everything you need to know about Margaret Thatcher, if I'm being honest. Though in 1985, William left his position in the ultra right wing group after a disagreement over the Anglo-Irish agreements and after being threatened when he had complained that somebody had been collecting funds behind the bar for the IRA. The last part was only mentioned in a couple of sources, so I'm not sure whether that was a legitimate reason or just speculation, but we know for sure that he didn't like the Anglo-Irish agreement and that's one of the reasons he left. William wasn't what you could describe as being a dedicated student when it came to his studies at Teesside Polytechnic, and he actually failed his second year exams. Though he did manage to pass his second year after resitting the exams, and he went on to graduate in 1987 with a third class degree. Students at Teesside Polytechnic would describe him as being quiet and a closed book. Though unbeknownst to his former classmates, William was living a double life. He began going out to pick up young men, travelling to Newcastle to cruise the city's nightclubs and nightlife. And this actually saw him starting to flag up on the computers of the authorities, with reports of him cutting young men with razor blades falling into the police's laps. Though, despite a police inquiry, no charges were brought against him. It's hypothesised that William's victims were far too worried for their reputation to come forward and didn't want to receive any publicity. After all, the slashings had occurred during same-sex hookups. It's important to note that despite same-sex sexual activities being legalised in England in the 1960s between two consenting adults above the age of 21, homophobia was still extremely commonplace within society. And you could argue that even today, homophobia still is rooted within English society. The age of consent wouldn't be lowered to 16, the same age of consent for heterosexual sexual activities in the UK until 2001. So it was only natural for victims who had been closeted to not want to be outed by filing reports against William. They were all under the age of 21 as well at this point, by the way. Though this only fueled William's bizarre sexual fantasies. In May of 1987, the body of a 28-year-old student called Barry Oldman was found on a secluded country lane in North Yorkshire. Barry's throat had been found cut, and it was determined that Barry's attacker had made an attempt to dismember his remains. Investigators immediately began trying to establish a timeline of events to try to figure out what had happened in the hours and days leading up to Barry's tragic death. And it was during these inquiries that they learnt Barry had met a man at a gay club in Newcastle called Rock Shots and had gone back to this man's flat. After which, Barry and this man started what would be a short-term relationship. It was quickly determined that this man, Barry's partner, had been none other than William Beggs. The pair had actually gone on a camping trip to the North Yorkshire Moors, but William had come back from the trip alone. William was immediately arrested and questioned in connection to Barry's murder, and he told the authorities that Barry had made homosexual advances and had attacked him during their trip, and so he had killed them in self-defence. William was subsequently charged with the murder of Barry Oldham, and the trial date was soon set. The case against William was quick, and the jury ultimately ruled against his favour and found him guilty on one count of murder and on two counts of wounding. Though William would only serve 18 months in prison before the conviction against him would be quashed and he would be released. This was due to the fact that the prosecution in the trial had linked up the wounding charges, the previous reports that William had slashed other men with a razor blade, with the murder of Barry Oldham to try to show a pattern of behaviour. This hadn't been something that the judges in William's appeal hearing agreed with. 
They had decided that joining the slashings and the murder in such a manner was prejudicial, and thus didn't permit William to have a fair trial. The general public were shocked to see the release of William Beggs, with the students who had lived next door to William telling journalists that she was stunned by the news and that the authorities had promised her that he'd never be released. After his successful appeal, William moved back to Northern Ireland, but didn't end up staying there long before moving to Kilmarnock in Scotland. William's new neighbours nicknamed him Fred West, after an infamous serial killer from the 1960 to the 1980s. According to one source, Fred West had been an English serial killer who committed at least 12 murders between 1967 and 1987 in Gloucestershire, alongside his second wife, Rosemary West. The fact that William's neighbours nicknamed him Fred West speaks volumes for the impression he gave them and the atmosphere that followed him around. Despite the opportunity for William to start afresh, a second chance at life, a new leaf, William threw this chance away. In fact, his violence only became more and more frequent. In 1995, William was arrested for aggravated assault after committing grievous bodily harm with a razor on a church youth worker that he'd picked up. His victim had been forced to escape from the window of his flat from the first floor, or the second floor for my American viewers, both naked and bleeding. Testimony from the church youth worker revealed that William had stood over him, slashing at his legs with the razor and shouting in a rage, quote, things will be over soon you have made me do this. William was arrested and was sent to be examined by a psychiatrist to determine his mental state, and the psychiatric report stated that William was a danger to the public due to his abnormal personality. After this attack, William was arrested for a second time and was sentenced to six years in prison, though William would only end up serving half of his sentence. And as you might have guessed, after William was let free from prison, he returned straight to his violence. After his release, William moved back to Kilmarnock in Scotland, and rightfully his neighbours feared for their lives. His neighbours actually attempted to have him evicted from his flat, though William retaliated this by buying the council flat he lived in, and by installing home security cameras to prevent and record any vandalisms or attacks on his home. You see, people in the local community, especially gangs, had started graffitiing his car and graffitiing his house, so he put up all the CCTV to try and catch them in the act. William's flat was situated in a cul-de-sac on the outskirts of Kilmarnock, which gave William easy access to the main roads leading in and out of the town. Despite William's criminal record, he still managed to enrol and start studying computer science at Paisley University, where he would graduate with a master's degree in information technology. And using that degree, William landed a job at a call centre in Edinburgh. William, throughout all of this, frequented the local church and led camping trips into the surrounding countryside. It's important to note that the authorities have been unable to say with any certainty whether William had killed any more victims other than the ones we're talking about in this video. And unfortunately, there were more victims. Barry Wallace was a shelf stacker at Tesco, a supermarket, and was considering a lifelong career in the Navy. Family and friends of Barry described him as being a shy but popular person. His future was promising and full of hope and dreams and aspirations. A future that would be torn violently from him. On Sunday the 5th of December 1999, in Kilmarnock, Scotland, 18-year-old Barry Wallace had gone for a night out with his colleagues to a gay bar after his shift had ended. Though, when he didn't return home after the night out, alarm bells started to ring. Barry's last known location had been at a taxi rank in Kilmarnock, where he was supposedly meant to be getting a taxi to meet his friends at the local gay bar. The last person to have seen Barry alive had been 20-year-old Graeme Box, and he stated that he and Barry had gotten into a drunken altercation, and although a few punches were thrown, both men shook hands and came out of the fight relatively unharmed. Unfortunately though, after this, Barry didn't make it to the gay bar, and was instead lured into the apartment of William Beggs. When Barry and William got to William's apartment, Barry's arms and legs were both handcuffed to prevent him from escaping. William then physically assaulted Barry, drugged him, and sexually assaulted him in extremely violent ways. Medical professionals would later testify that the sexual assault had been so extreme that Barry may have actually died from shock before bleeding out. 
They further says that the ligature marks on his wrists were so severe that it proved Barry had been struggling and fighting for his life. After William had finished his evil acts, he disposed of Barry's body by dismembering it and dispersing his limbs around Loch Lomond. William actually kept Barry's head for a few days following the murder before disposing it in the sea at Troon to Belfast. On Friday the 17th of December 1999, a woman who had been walking her dog stumbled across a severed head washed ashore on a beach in Troon, Aisha. Shortly thereafter, the police were able to confirm that the severed head was in fact Barry Wallace. A week and a half after the gruesome discovery, the authorities recovered a part of Barry's legs from Loch Lomond in Balmahar, which was close to the area where the rest of Barry's remains would later be found. An autopsy was conducted on the remains to try to uncover any further evidence and to try to determine the cause of death, and this autopsy revealed that Barry had ligature marks to his wrists and ankles, indicative of struggling in restraints, as we spoke about. After a careful examination of the modus operandi for the suspect's criminal profile, the authorities began to pursue William Beggs as their first suspect in the case. William actually caught wind of the fact that he'd been made prime suspect in the Barry Wallace case, though he maintained a calm and collected public appearance, even attending an office party in the evening of the 16th of December. The police closed in on William the following day, on the 17th of December, raiding his apartment. Though William wasn't there. It was proposed that William had stayed with another gay friend before fleeing. Despite William's absence, the authorities uncovered numerous pieces of evidence against him. The block in which William lived was sealed off to allow full searches to be completed, and the authorities took over 5,000 different items away for closer forensic examination. The detectives also spoke with William's neighbours, who told them that they had heard the sound of soaring on the nights that Barry Wallace had disappeared. Alongside the evidence uncovered in connection to Barry Wallace's case, the blood of 17 other people were determined to have been present in William's apartments. This saw him being made the prime suspect in the cases of Derek Sheeran, Colin Switek, River Clyde and Paul Christie, though more information about those cases hasn't come to light and I'm not sure whether those investigations went any further. William learnt of the raid on his apartment in the afternoon of December 17th due to a BBC broadcast covering it, and he didn't hesitate to attempt to evade justice. He drove to Luton Airport that night, slipping through the police's net and abandoned his car. William then travelled down to Heathrow Airport and under the name W. Frederick, he boarded a flight out to Jersey. And then from Jersey, he boarded a different flight to Dinard, which was near St. Malo in France. By the 27th of December 1999, William had travelled on to Amsterdam. It was while he was in Amsterdam that he instructed a lawyer, and under his lawyer's guidance, he finally surrendered to the Dutch police. But he didn't go down quietly. He publicly stated that he had intended to fight his extradition back to Scotland, stating that he wouldn't receive a fair trial. Despite his protests, William was successfully extradited back to Scotland to stand trial. The detectives had gathered substantial evidence against William, connecting him to the murder and disappearance of Barry Wallace, and naturally this gave the prosecution a very strong case. On the bedside table in William's flat, a key to a set of handcuffs was found and in a cupboard outside of William's flat where plastic bags had been stored, it was found that some of the bags had the same distinct logo, Scandinavian Seaways, as the one that Barry's dismembered head had been recovered in. Dried blood was also found near the kitchen door handle, around the washing machine, and on the bedroom mattress and carpet. DNA samples taken from these bloodstains were tested, and they were determined to have been a match for the genetic profile of Barry Wallace. It was stated that the DNA samples held a one in a billion chance of it not belonging to Barry. Further, DNA samples taken from the mattress were found to contain the genetic profile of both Barry Wallace and William. Blood found on a kitchen knife was also tested and that came back as a match for Barry Wallace's genetic profile. Samples were taken from under the handbrake of William's car and from the back of the passenger seat, which returned a positive match for Barry Wallace's DNA. William's apartment itself had been freshly redecorated, albeit poorly. The walls had been freshly painted and the carpets deeply cleaned. 
After the authorities had spoken to a friend of William's, they learnt that William had actually been familiar with the area where he had dumped Barry's remains. William had actually told his friend about this area, saying, quote, that road goes to nowhere, it's a dead end. The friend also recalled a telephone conversation that he'd had with William at 5.40pm on the 5th of December, the day after Barry Wallace went missing. And in this phone call, William had told his friend that, quote, he was driving to Edinburgh and that he had got off with a young guy, a real sweetie. The friend describes William as being quite pleased with himself and somewhat smug, boasting about his sexual conquest. The actions of what William did in the days after the murder were heavily scrutinised by the prosecution. On the 7th of December 1999, reports of the discovery of human remains being found in Loch Lomond began to surface, and William left work early, claiming to have fallen ill. That evening, William travelled to Belfast on the 9.30pm Troon Ferry. The next day, William phoned up his manager and told him that he wouldn't be able to work for the rest of the week. On the 10th of December, though, William did return back to Kilmarnock and was seen buying paintbrushes, floor dye and sandpaper at a DIY store. The next day, on the 11th of December, he purchased some wallpaper at a different store and then boarded another ferry back to Belfast. It was speculated that on this ferry, William disposed of Barry's severed head by throwing it overboard. But what really happened, only William knew. William maintained his innocence throughout the 17-day trial, though William's defence team failed to call any witnesses to support his claims. You see, his defence team had actually settled on a different tactic, a sexual adventure gone badly wrong. During his own testimony, William actually told the jury that it wasn't a crime in Scotland to dismember a dead body, and his defence team criticised what they believed to have been a hate smear campaign to demonise William. Though, the jury wasn't stupid, and they didn't agree with the defence's story at all. In October of 2001, William Beggs was found guilty for the razor blade mutilation and murder of Barry Wallace. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. William showed no emotion as the verdict was read out to the court, and only showed any emotion when he found out that he was going to be put on the sex offenders register. But this isn't where this case ends. William's parents and aunts launched legal action against the police force that had investigated William. They claimed in this legal action that the police had wrongfully arrested and interrogated them on the 4th of January in the year 2000. In this legal action, it stated that the police had suspected William's parents and aunts of helping him redecorate his flat after the murder of Barry Wallace. William had phoned them several times after the murder, and so the police had questioned them for six hours and had taken their fingerprints and mouth swabs. Due to this, William's parents were seeking aggravated and exemplary damages. This legal action, though, would ultimately be dropped after it was dismissed in favour of the chief constable. William himself then also launched legal action against the prison that he had been sent to, claiming that they had failed to provide him with secure computer facilities, which was a breach of his, quote, human rights. He argued that his correspondence should remain private. You see, the prison had actually given William a personal computer, but he was forced to save his work to a hard disk as he had to give, give the personal computer back, and it was like on a loan basis. William would actually lose this case, though. The judicial review ended up costing the taxpayer at least £15,000. It was then announced that William was going to enter into a civil partnership with a man he had met in prison, a 43-year-old who had been sentenced to imprisonment after having sex with minors. The authorities stated that they would not allow the two men to share a cell, and William claims that he may seek legal action over this decision. And finally, in April 2006, William asked the Edinburgh High Court to set him free, pending an appeal against his conviction, though this request was denied. William Beggs remains behind bars to this day, and I sincerely hope that he never sees freedom again. He has proven time and time again that he does not learn, that he cannot be rehabilitated, that he cannot be a trusted member of society. The argument that William's internalised homophobia was the root of his violence is quite simply invalid. Thousands, if not millions, of LGBTQA plus folk have spent and continue to spend their lives in secrecy, many with very difficult upbringings. It is not an excuse for murder. None of those people, none of none of all those thousands, if not millions of LGBTQA plus people 
have gone out and murdered people be willy-nilly because of their internalized homophobia or because they have to be closeted. William Beggs is an evil man, and I hope his conviction has provided justice for the family and friends of his victims. And that's everything that we have for you in today's case. Make sure you subscribe to this channel and you hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video, just like this one. Leave a comment down below letting me know your thoughts and opinions on this case. I'm interested to see what you think. I'll be live on Twitch at 10 p.m. UK time, which is an hour after this video is posted. Make sure you jump on over to twitch.tv forward slash Josh Miles to hang out. You can find a link at the top of the description and a link in the pinned comments. On Fridays, we, on the stream, we go through um, cases together, we go through internet mysteries, we deep dive into different things. So if you want to be part of that, make sure you jump over and follow me over there. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. A special thank you to all of my Patreon members for helping keep this channel afloat, but especially thank you to my lead investigators for all of your support. If you'd like to support this channel for less than $5 a month, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash it's Joshua Miles. For less than $5 a month, you'll get early access to videos and access to scripts and also polls on cases. This episode was researched by Satin and myself, written for this episode by myself with the support of Flinders, Peach, Layla Blount, and Satin. If you or someone you know has been affected by issues covered in our programming, including this episode, then please use the link in the description for information, advice, and support.